Welcome to another episode of Chatting with Stacks. I'm your host, Bill Stacks, and today I got Gary Jenkins. What's up, man? Hey, Bill. What's up? How you doing? Good. So uh, last time you were here, we talked about your law enforcement career. Yes. And um, I want to talk today about the organized crime aspect of it. Okay. Uh, let me get so, started uh, with that. Yeah, like when when did um, that come into play with your uh, career? Yeah, it was kind of interesting. I think uh, I uh, <laughs> I saw a report one time from somebody that, and they said they were going to tell intelligence about it. And I was like a young street policeman. I thought, intelligence? Who's that? So I started asking around. Couldn't find anybody that knew anything about them or knew anybody that worked down there. Yeah. So, uh, and I did find out there was some super secret kind of a unit that, that had an off-site that uh, was not, you never saw them in police headquarters or, or you never saw them anywhere. So I, I researched and found out who the sergeants were and who was down there and, and uh, then made a call and, and had some kind of little tidbit of information and got to know one of the sergeants and went down there one day and talked to him, asked his advice about something I was working on. And he kind of smiled and <laughs> he knew what I was doing, but I was, I was starting my politic and early cause I wanted to go there. That's where I wanted to go. I was a detective, a burglary detective at the time. And, but I wanted to go there because I knew they worked on the big boys and, and, and made, uh, you know, they really made cases. They, uh, we'll get into that in a little bit, but, but they, they worked on the big boys and they had a lot of freedom and they got to have what we call slick cars. Uh, that means that, uh, they, they were like mainly old used rental cars is what, what we bought. Although when I first came in, we had three cars for six guys and two sergeants. <laughs> so it was, uh, and the sergeants drove the car, the cars home back and forth to work at home. And, oh. and, and if you had two guys working, we'd have two guys working nights and they'd go get one of the sergeants, drive over to the sergeant's house and get his car and then go work and then drop him back off at his house. So he didn't have to drive back and forth to work. And we oh got more, more cars. Later on, we got more cars and a bigger budget. But, but that's kind of, you know, it, but you know, this was kind of a deal that, that I worked on it and worked on it, got to know the sergeants and then they had a need for, some extra people because we had the Republican National Convention came to town. Well, people in the intelligence unit were demonstrators and, and any any groups that would advocate civil disorder. Well, so in 1976, we had all these different uh, uh, groups coming in. Uh, it was kind of right on the heels of the SDS and a lot of the bombings out of the late 60s and early 70s. And so some of them were still around. And, and, and you know, they needed to gather intelligence on them. So I got to go down there and work with, a, an old, actually ended up working with a Secret Service agent most of the time and, and uh, driving around the convention, whatever, where the convention was. And our job was to uh, do protective intelligence. If, uh, if somebody stumbled across somebody that just wasn't quite right, but they didn't really have any, they didn't, they didn't really have anything particularly, they'd call us and we'd go over and take them aside and talk to them and check them out and find out what the deal was, or maybe take them to a room that we had set aside just for those kinds of interviews. So, uh, and after that, they had an opening and, and my good friend from actually I grew up with was already down there and he was putting in a good word for me. And, and I went down there and, and uh, it was, it made all the difference in the world. It was, uh, I tell you, I never had so much fun for 13 years of my entire life as working in the intelligence unit. You had long, complete freedom, complete I'll, freedom. Yeah. How long were you, how long were you a police officer before you, before this all happened? Uh, about four years. I think two years in patrol and two years as a uh, burglar detective. And then, uh, then I went into intelligence unit about that. And this was the early 70s, right? Right. It was 1976, actually. I came on in 71. So it was actually five years total uh, in patrol and detective unit where I went in there. So when did you start, like, first hearing about organized crime? You know, I didn't know anything much about organized crime before I went down there. I, I knew, you know, you know, I had read uh, about Balachi. I had read the book. I think there was a book. Uh, Joe Bellacci, so I, I knew that much about it. I didn't know anything about Kansas City organized crime other than that supposedly we had mobsters here in Kansas City. Uh, I don't know. I was too busy running around trying to catch armed robbers when I was in patrol or burglars in the prog in process or make cases on burglars. And I didn't really, I didn't really study it out. You know, it's kind of interesting. I think back like, well, I should have thought more about that, paid more attention, but I didn't. Back then, what, though, weren't wasn't the government trying to say that it didn't exist too? 
I know that was, uh, we have to go on back uh, when we talk about Nick Sabella, particularly why uh, it, it, they had started admitting that the FBI had started admitting that there was a mafia after 1957, after the, the upstate New York Appalachian Convention got busted with these mobsters from all over the United States and Nick Sabella and, and, uh, and an older guy from the Prohibition days, uh, Joe Flardo, was caught. There, there, there's Nick's, uh, there's Nick, and there's Nick's car. They tried to shoot him up. <laughs> it got in trouble what? here in Kansas City. Oh man! So what happened there in that little? Uh, well, let's see. he was Nick in 1946. He was. This is a little later on, but in 1946, he and a guy named Bugsy Anch and a couple other young guys were robbing gambling games you know a lot of young mobsters they go out and uh, organize crime guys that rob other people who aren't protected um, and to, today they rob drug dealers uh, back then they're robbing gambling games gamblers that uh, somebody somebody have a high stakes game in the back of their business or someplace like that they they scout those things out and they rob those games because they figure nobody's gonna go to uh, the police on them anyhow yeah uh, out of that uh so they they'd robbing games. Well, they robbed a couple of protected games, and I don't know if they knew it, did it intentionally. Some say that he did it intentionally because he didn't care. He kind of was giving a, a, a f you to to the ruling faction at the time. Yeah, but was he a made man at the time? Uh, you know, I doubt it. I doubt it. I, he probably wouldn't have done that. He, he would yeah. not have, have done that. He probably wasn't really made until he came back from Chicago. Because what happened is they killed Bugsy Hanks. Found his body, and Nick knew that he was he was in the world of shit. Then he was sitting at a liquor store in that old black Chevy, I think the Chevrolet, yep. sitting in a liquor store. And for some reason, he was meeting a local deputy sheriff named uh, I think it was Joe Cuchilla. And for some reason, Nick had slid over and was in the passenger side, and this deputy was sitting there in the driver's seat. He wasn't driving him. He had just met him there, is my understanding. And, and for some reason, Nick had slid over and that guy got in the, in the driver's seat and somebody, you know, put him on the spot, as they used to say, you know, uh, dropped a dime on him, whatever. Let, they saw him sitting down there, saw his car down there, and they just pulled up and started blasting away. And they killed the deputy, and Nick rolled out that right side. And, it, and that was the last they saw him. And he ran to Chicago at the time. And, and uh, hit out up there and kind of was taken in by, uh, they say Charlie, Charlie no to Gioi. I'm, I'm not sure exactly who it was, but but somebody took him in and, and protected him while he was up there in Chicago for about the next, oh, I want to say three or four years, so, somewhere along that for the next three years at least. He must have done something for him up there in Chicago. Uh, he had a relative or two up there, so that's probably, you know, probably how he was able to get protected in Chicago. So he, he hung out up there. Finally, I'm surprised, they, I'm surprised but, the cops didn't try to arrest him for the murder of the police officer. <laughs> right? You know, I, I think maybe this is 1946 Kansas City. I think maybe they didn't want to really investigate anything about that police officer. Actually, it was, it was a deputy sheriff, which is a totally different deal. Like many big counties the city police are the police the county yeah. sheriffs are jailers and and kind of the police serve papers and do all that and that's about all jackson county other way out in the eastern part of the county they did a little bit of police work had some road patrols out there but mainly they were just political uh jobs political students really and did stuff that, that the politicians wanted is what the deputies did back then especially but nobody really wanted to get into that deputy getting killed or what he was doing there i don't think so no way nobody pushed that and plus they didn't do that kind of shit back then they wouldn't try to uh, they didn't push every law to the very extent of everything that they could do back in those days like we do today yeah, there was a lot of letting things slide right <laughs> a lot of letting things slide especially when it's a, a mafia political kind of a deal going on like that they didn't really want to get into it so was it a lot of people from chicago that would be in kansas city uh you know the, I, they had a lot of connections 
as far as you know us seeing them down here no we didn't really see them down here but there's a lot of connections be between the two over the phone and they may do some kind of business together you know probably the most well reported interaction was during the scam of course but before that during this time for example uh, uh during the war during world war ii there was a guy named uh uh, uh, Paul the waiter Rica and Joe Campania and and then Cherry Nose Gioe. I think those were the three. They were, they were reasonably high ranking people. They were uh, Cardo didn't go. Uh, Cardo was around, but he, of course he never did any time hardly. Uh, uh, but these three guys got caught up in a deal where they were extorting money from Hollywood film companies out in Los Angeles, and they made a case on them, uh, and they all got. Pretty, I think they got like, I think want to say like 10 years in, in the penitentiary and we're all down Leavenworth. And they would send, people would come down from- That's Paul, Chicago. Paul Rica. That's Paul Rica, it is Paul Rica, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, people would come down to visit them and they would always be met by somebody in Kansas City who would at the train station here in Kansas City and they would drive them up to Leavenworth. And, and I read one thing where it was always, uh, Tony Gizzo's car, who Tony Gizzo was the boss kind of just before Nick Savala or during that time around the, during the war. Actually, there was another boss right after him. There's Nick. And I can't believe that, that one picture on the left, he looks so weird. It just didn't look like him yeah. at all. Have, have you met him? No, no, I never met no. him. But your deputies and all that had dealings with them, right? Well, mainly, you know, the guys that actually talked to him, the FBI, just a couple of them, they, uh, Bill Owsley and, and Lee Flossie, they made him a project. They would see him down at the city market, and, and what they used to do, especially Flossie, he was, he was kind of a bad boy. They'd have, they both smoke cigars, and so they go up and they start talking to Nick, and, and Flossie would take this cigar and put a huge drag on it, just blow it out right in Nick's face. They were always trying to do stuff that's disrespectful. See, both those guys are Italian, and they hated the reputation that the mob Italians brought on the rest of the people. So they, uh, they really, uh, they had it in for Nick Savella. Just like Giuliani, right? Yeah, like Giuliani. Yeah. Yeah, so when so when you get transferred into this uh, organized crime task force, yeah, is it? Do you did you ever have dealings with any of these mobsters before, like that, and you didn't know about it, and you're like, oh my god, I didn't know that he was even involved in that. <laughs> was there people like that? Oh, there was there was probably some bar owners and stuff down on West Twelfth Street. I can't even remember their name. I kind of. Figured out who they were later on. They were they were periphery characters. You know, they were all. I was. I I had to. Uh, I got a stint or two on foot patrol down there. And this string of bars, block long string of of uh, what we call uh, uh, dance clubs or, or go go bars. I think they, them. they all had girls in there, beat girls, and and they would charge for drinks. And and I had a foot patrol along there, so I would go in and out of those bars and. And they'd all get to know me and, and tell me to come back later on when I was off and they'd give me free drinks if I wanted to and, <laughs> and flirt with the girls yeah. a little bit. They'd flirt with me. <laughs> so, uh, but but as far as like, you know, uh, these guys just, you know, they didn't, for uniform policemen or, or burglary policemen, they just weren't in our bailiwick. They just didn't come. We just didn't have any reason to interact with them. And I didn't live that life that I was hanging out in joints and trying to get to know them. I was, I was too young. I was only 22, 23 years old. And, and I didn't grow up with any of them. Like some of these guys, maybe they grew up over in the, in the neighborhood. So they had some, but I never did. Yeah. So was it like, were they, did they have like a back room with, with all the pictures tacked up and all that? <laughs> well, we, sure. We had that. We had, you know, you walk in the office and you had the, uh, uh, captain's office and, and then the two sergeants office and the back was just one huge big room uh, with a billboard, a billboard, a bulletin board with all the pictures tacked up on the wall. And then we had a file room next to that that had some more, another bulletin board with some more pictures tacked up on it. So we kind of keep from trying to keep their faces familiar. We get some new pictures of somebody, we throw them up there so the other guys could see them. Were they worried about people talking to them? No, no. They weren't no, worried no. about leaks? 
No, no, they didn't worry about that at all. There was, there was really no, we, they, we really didn't have any informants in Kansas City. Uh, no. There was a few highly placed uh, guys that, that talked to a couple, three FBI agents, kind of just in general gossip. When you go back and you know, I've done some freedom of information requests, on a couple, three guys. And, and when you get that, you can see where they're talking about, you know, in, uh, uh, source number ST1, source number ST2 and things like that. And you could tell they were, they were reporting just kind of in general information, what they heard. They were, there was nobody that was really in the know that was doing any talking, not, yes. not that was putting any kind of reports as far as I could tell. As far as, and I've got to know uh, a couple of them, one of them real well, since I retired and you know, he, he didn't have any real, and he was about the best guy down there. And he didn't really have any really good deep throat guy. Just a lot of different people. That's how, that's how people mainly work organized crime is you have a whole lot of different people that tell you little tidbits, little tidbit here, little tidbit there. And, and then you have to decide whether it's true or not, or whether it's some kind of a cover story that's trying to cover up something else. Yeah. So it's, uh, it's, it, it, and so you have to, uh, to, evaluate all the information you get, who it came from, maybe if you know, and if it fits with anything else, and if it's logical and rational, or is it just some story that somebody made up, floated out there. Like one time they floated out a story, they had killed, they killed this older, this, there's three Spiral brothers, four Spiral brothers all together, and they got on the wrong side of Nick Savella. And, the mob here in Kansas City that made guys. None of them were made. They all wanted to be. None of them were made, but they were they were up and comers and they were gung ho guys. And a couple of them were real charismatic and had a lot of people who liked them and followed them. And uh, would would have gone, you know, would gone with them if there would have been a chance to go with them. They liked them. And the oldest brother, uh, uh, where was I going with this? All of a sudden, uh, he. He got killed. He was he was he was known as an up and comer. He was in the Teamsters Union. He was doing their bidding in the Teamsters Union. He, he he had a lot of people working with him and for him to do some good thefts and and he's bringing that stuff back and <coughs> and the mob would you know get a piece of that action. Yes, yeah. of course, and and he did all that, but he just you know he got too big for his britches. Everybody said. And you just don't do that in Nick Savella's family mob. And he also, I found reports where they were, the informants were talking about, they were saying things like, well, well, who is this Nick Sparrow? He dresses like a friggin' hippie. And, uh, and several other comments about how he dressed. And he, this was the seventies, late sixties, yeah. early seventies. And he did. When I, I saw the picture of him in his trunk after they killed him and he had on a flower and they were bib overalls, but they were flowers. They had flowers all over him, and, and he had real long hair and a few Manchu, and, and Nick did not like facial hair. He told everybody, if you wanted to be in, you didn't get facial hair back then or long hair. And so, uh, you know, some people, there are a lot of speculations of why they killed him. I think it's probably because they were afraid that he was trying to get too big for his britches in that Teamsters Union. Is they were putting pressure to get another Spiro brother a, a good job in the Teamsters Union, and they were resisting that. They had somebody else they wanted to have the job. So they but killed the oldest. They killed, killed the oldest. Old, killed the oldest. Yeah. Yeah. I think I found him. Well, that that tells a little bit about Nick uh, Nick Savella, as as he was immensely conservative. He was pretty well read, not educated, of course, but you know he read a lot. Yeah, and he he you know, he was real conservative. We had a guy, uh, a local an Italian lawyer. Actually, this guy's dad was a uh, uh, was a fence for him. He was a made guy. Uh, name was Tiger Cartarella. He called him Tiger, uh, and he was a fence. He had a record shop, and and back in the sixties and seventies, this was the place to buy albums, and they, and he had boosters going all over the Midwest filling up the trucks of their cars with albums from record stores and bringing them back and selling them to him for about 25 cents on the dollar. And people, and then he'd sell them out to people for about 75 cents on the dollar. And, you know, everybody's making money except the record store. Yeah. Uh, but of course they just pass it along to all of us who are buying records at retail. Here's Nick. That's Zero. Nick, yeah. Yeah, see, he's got that cockeye. He's got that, yeah. Uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> and here's the blanket that there, there is. There, there's those overalls. <laughs> yeah, man. You got some boots on, huh? Hey, so what they, combat what boots they, and overalls. I forgot what about did they do? Shoot them? Yeah. You shot them? Yeah. yeah. Um. So, what happened with the younger brothers? The well, Spiro that's when that's, that's yeah. we started the, the Savella Spiro War. That's my last movie was uh, uh, Brothers Against Brothers, the Savella Spiro War. As Carl, the youngest, was he was real charismatic, like his oldest brother. And people would, guys would follow him, and he was a really good professional thief. He traveled all over, did jewelry store heist or, or burglaries, actually, or he had connections on the docks. He'd buy, you know, he'd steal a, a trailer load of clothes, uh, fence them back out through uh, Savella or the other, uh, the, the, the mob, really. They would they would connect him up with a store. And they had these stores around that would take those clothes like that and sell them out at retail. We don't really have that anymore. We used to have a lot of that. We had like the record store that was filled with stolen records. We had a couple of small independently owned clothing stores. They were basically filled with stolen clothes. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, we had a place with all the different farm, like a, like a uh, uh, drug store. that had everything you wanted to buy at a drug store practically except prescription drugs. And that was all boosted stuff. And, and you go down there and, and uh, and do that. So, but the youngest brother was that kind of a thief, and actually, he was in the penitentiary when they killed his oldest brother, Nick. And, and everybody swore that he said he was gonna he was gonna get some payback for that. He came back out shortly thereafter. I don't know, within six months or under a year after his oldest brother was killed, and he had two other brothers, Mike, who was his teamsters, who was a little kind of a low level teamsters official. There's Mike, and Carl, and Joe. 